Guten Morgen Europa. Good morning everybody. Uh, welcome from Zagreb to Moscow, from Istanbul to Brest. Welcome to the first public debate on European universities. My name is Tino Brömme. I am the host of this uh, conversation about a new phenomenon in higher education, that is European university alliances. These are kind of experimental networks um, that work which is, which, um, with each other and with their um, surroundings, with their innovative ecosystems for a better Europe. At least Emmanuel Macron wanted it like this. Um, I'm very happy that we have um, this conversation here today at the Berlin Science Week. Um, I want to thank Christine Brummer and her team for the excellent work and um, I will go into the program of the Berlin Science Week afterwards, which is the whole week with hundreds of um, interesting presentations and um, talks about science, about research, about education, and they have never been as online as this year, as you can imagine. I'm also very happy that we heard of a lot of um, participants online regist registered to this talk from all over the place. These are members of University Alliance, but also interested citizens who want to participate in um, the, this discussion, who want to participate in shaping education policy. So um, for our part, we have installed Slido. This is um, an online platform where you can insert your questions or rate the questions of others. You just uh, digit in um, slido.com or slide.do and our event um, code, which is UUU, like European Universities and another U. And um, then you can um, enter your questions, which we will possibly read during the conversation. Um, let me just say this is the first of a series um, that we want to repeat every month with new members of University Alliances. Um, <clears throat> this is the first time to do this kind of format online from me too. So if something goes wrong, your screen turns black or the screen starts to smoke or your laptop explodes, it's certainly my fault. So my apologies <laughs> in advance. So, but now let's start um, um, and welcome our guests. Um, we have um, in the first half of our conversation, we have three guests, uh, Daniela Trani, Ludovic Tilly and Peter van der Heiden. Daniela Trani, she's the director of the UFA Alliance. She's um, joining us from Maastricht. And um, she has studied, studied physics, oncology, and biotechnology. And she's a great, um, her great passion is um, space exploration. Actually, she was a um, candidate in the last ESA astronaut selection in 2008. So um, her uh, passion goes into the wide. Her counterpart is Ludovic Tilly. Uh, who is the coordinator of the EC2U Alliance from Poitiers. Um, he's also a physicist, but he goes into the microscopically small. He is um, studying the deformation um, of uh, nanomaterials. Um, we come to him in a moment. And our first um, member of the um, conversation here um, in the first half is Peter van der Heiden. He is an um, independent strategy analyst, uh, strategy advisor for universities. He has worked in the European Commission for 23 years, as well in the research as in the uh, education department. And he will be kind of the advocatus diaboli, and um, he can interfere when he has questions or something during the debate. Um, let's start now with... Um, Dottoressa Trani, Ms. Trani, welcome to our debate. Um, uh, you know, I'm mostly interested in um, examples, concrete examples. The Youth Alliance is consisting of 10, is a very big alliance of 10 universities who came together to work together. Um, what can you do as an alliance that you um, cannot do alone as Maastricht University, for example? First of all, Tino, good morning also, good morning to everyone that's connected today, although we cannot see each other often in the next event organized by, by Tino, this will be possible, and thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel together with uh, Ludovic and Peter. So that's a very interesting question, Tino. Uh, there is a lot that you can do as an alliance which you would not do easily as a single university. And I will give you an example that uh, um, 
has to do with our educational activities. So, of course, the Erasmus program has allowed our students already for the past decades to um, study across European countries. Uh, but what we are trying to build within UFE and what we have launched as a pilot activity in July is a framework where our students can much more flexibly choose their curriculum. So we pull together, for example, our educational offer, our educational expertise to give them the possibility to pick those courses that will best contribute to shaping the curriculum that will allow them to achieve their professional and personal development goals. In our youth introduction offer that was launched at the end of July for um, a small group of students, because let's not forget, we are in a pilot phase. So we are working with relatively small numbers. We have had the first 200 students enrolling to take up two academic courses, up to two academic courses and one language course in the first semester. The courses offered by our alliance are delivered by all the 10 universities that are part of our um, network. So I think this is uh, unique and it can be really a game changer in the future of higher education. Well, this is an uh, interesting point. You said the students are participating in creating the curriculum. I don't understand this. I mean, normally students, even when they leave in universities, they don't know what they want to do. How can they create um, a curriculum or a study plan for someone else? Is this a miracle? A miracle? <laughs> so they're choosing for themselves. And of course, they do it also with the supervision. But uh, you actually touched upon a point that is uh, still valid in our alliance because our students, with their experience, will contribute to co-create the programs and education of the future. And in our next um, pilot activity, we will have the students enrolled to actually sign up a co-creation agreement so that their contribution is not only real, but it's also proven for uh, yeah, their, own, their own track as well. So it's not that they will be immediately deciding randomly which courses are added to the programs, but they will have the possibility because of a more flexible framework to select what will be of added value for their training. Now you will, have, you will have, you have involved the students already in the application, in the, in the, in the project of UFA. so you have discussed with students about this. Um, do you have the impression that the students who participated, that they had a, a good a grasp of what is uh, the, the necessary um, um, curricular topics of today? What, what was your, were your impression? Students indeed uh, already since the very beginning, since March or April 2018, as part of our core group, core development group. And this group of students also grew uh, over, the, over time. And currently we have a student forum, of which I'm very proud, that's composed of 30 students, three from each partner university. They not only have a good idea about what is needed for a, a resilient and relevant education, they can also very sharply make a connection with what is societally relevant. And especially now, at times of COVID, they bring in the perspective from the students that are brought into a completely different context. They are not able to attend lessons always in the same way. Uh, and they provide each other with mutual support, but they can also advise on which tools would be relevant for the future for our alliance, but also for individual universities. Um, um, you also um, have as a very core term of your project, a virtual campus. Now, I was wondering, I mean, uh, MOOCs and remote learning are anything but new. You have Coursera, you have edX, you have Iversity, I think it's German. And there are many non-commercial platforms too. And, and companies use uh, training online since ever. I mean, where's the new element here? Um, or is it a political thing to make universities create? What's the new element in this virtual campus? What we want to achieve with the virtual campus is provide a, a single door 
to enter our university community, not only for the students, but also for citizens and for other stakeholders. For the students, we want to allow them to apply and enroll for courses that are delivered by different universities via this virtual campus. You will not need to go to the website of one university or the other, but they will have this, uh, I would say, educational, uh, virtual educational highway, and they will also have access to the non-academic activities that the Alliance is building together with the non-academic partners, with the cities, the regions, the citizens. So it's much more than just a website. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And and also, um, you mentioned when we talked before, the Youth Academy. Um, I had the impression that this project has already started with some offers of, of lectures. Um, how does that work? And can I, have a, can I make a degree there or how is it? At the moment, this lecture, so the, the Academy was launched, uh, actually, it's launching tomorrow with the first mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. lecture. And the topic that is addressed in this first uh, uh, academy is European identity and responsibilities in a global world. There are 20 lectures over uh, five weeks until the 3rd of December, and it's open to all students, citizens, staff. Um, at the moment, uh, it's not uh, uh, that you will uh, get a degree. It's an activity that you undertake uh, voluntarily but of course, in the future, will also be something that can be connected to a citizen's learning curriculum, for example. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, when you have these different lectures of, um, um, of professors and other people who where I can learn something. Um, do they all speak in English? Or do they speak in different languages? Um, um, if, are there language problems? I mean, this is an interesting uh, fact in this uh, um, concept of the uh, university alliances too. How, um, how is the language question here? So the Academy, it's the first edition is in English currently, uh, but Really, uh, this is an important, a very important point, because as I said, we are targeting not only students whose English level is uh, um, already, um, has to be already at a certain level, but we are also targeting citizens, individuals that might not speak the language, a eh, foreign language, as well as, uh, uh, as this with the, the academy would require. So in the future, of course, ideally, we would like to have also um, multilingualism delivered. We, you could think of having subtitles, translations, and we will be exploring some of these venues. But as I said before, we have to start from something. So we launched this academy in English for uh, uh, this first version of the pilot. And the next step will have to be, for sure, to also um, investigate and test how we can uh, effectively um, also communicate in other languages. All right. All right. Well, this, uh, this is a point I'm very interested in because I also studied languages. Well, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to ask Ludovic also something because his alliance is also very interesting. Um, uh, Monsieur Tilly, bonjour. So, uh, so uh, comment, comment, comment ça va, ça va Potier? <laughs> Everything is very well, except that we are uh, now in, uh, under lockdown in France. But uh, that's a different story. Well, uh, we have a beautiful weather. You can look outside the window. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> um, uh, Monsieur Tilly, um, uh, you cannot imagine how much my visit in Poitiers last February encouraged me to continue this exploration of the European um, University Alliances. I want to thank you for that again. And, um, um, and the first point is that um, your concept of your uh, University Alliance um, which uh, entered the, uh, the group of university alliances just this year. Um, your name is um, Campus of City University. So there is a focus of the city and the university. And um, I would first ask, um, what does this mean? 
So, so this actually this whole story about uh, the strong cooperation between uh, cities and universities uh, is something that started uh, a long time ago. Um, it started actually under let's say a different framework. Uh, to be more precise, it started under the the Coimbra Group, that is a network of uh, long-standing uh, comprehensive uh, universities in Europe uh, that I'm also uh, chairing, but that's uh, again a, a different story. But this was based on a very uh, long-standing cooperation that uh, some universities do have with their cities, in particular when they were created several centuries ago. And with time, they really developed a sort of a symbiotic relationship with their cities. And this is in particular the case at, uh, at Poit in Poitiers, and this is how we uh, arrive to this concept of the so-called Poitiers Declaration, where we really create a framework where there is a, a real policy discussion between university and the city on all the fields uh, where universities are also playing. Uh, so basically now we would call that knowledge square. It was not called like that a few years ago, but this is clearly everything related to education, research, innovation, and service to society. Service to society being understood also in terms of bringing culture, bringing uh, critical thinking to the citizens and so on. So this whole concept of very strong cooperation with the city was at the core of our alliance. And all the seven universities that are in the alliance do have the same strong commitment to be in continuous contact with the citizens that are living uh, very close to the campuses, but uh, they, who are also actually participating to the many activities of the, of the universities. So this is why this is basically the EC2U DNA. Um. The, um, I could imagine that your um, um, close cooperation with the city, you can do it as Poitiers alone. Um, I wonder, um, what is the international cooperation adding here? Actually, you're right in the sense that uh, all our seven universities, they have already built some specific relationship. Not always the same, by the way. Sometimes there is a focus on something which is a bit more a sort of local um, specificity, if I may call it like that. But yeah, altogether, yeah. what we want to, to bring is all these strengths uh, to really create, and this is actually something that we are currently working on, on the uh, another uh, proposal that we are uh, developing for the Horizon 2020 uh, project, this idea of really building a sort of pan-European knowledge ecosystem where basically we would create a network of all these local ecosystems, which all together can really not only provide, uh, let's say, opportunities to the citizens to also learn what is going on at the different other universities, but also all the other actors, uh, typically the industries, the businesses, the SMEs, can also work at the level of that network. So it's really bringing new opportunities for all actors. Uh, but Ludovic, um, this last thing with the different actors who cooperate with the university, um, now uh, that your ECU2U alliance has been formed, can you give us an example? I know you're, the, the alliance has only started, but can you, can you give us an example, please? So actually, there are many, many things which were uh, already started without waiting to be selected. But of course, uh, everything will be uh, much faster now that we are officially uh, uh, under the label of this uh, initiative uh, by the European Commission. What we are currently starting is really create also tools. Uh, and that's an example of the things that we can uh, not really do uh, without the, uh, the, the expertise of other partners. We are really building at the level of, an, of the Alliance uh, some, some uh, joint tools. And one of them is called the ECTU Connect Center, which will actually be uh, a sort of a series of platforms which will be not only useful to the internal life of the alliance uh, I'm, I'm talking here about uh, managing the mobility of all these people the, stu the students teachers researchers etc uh, but also uh, making platforms where we can continuously be in contact with the, these other actors so uh, that, that will really uh, boost the capacity to cooperate by uh, having joint 
uh, shared tools. And that's a typical example. Another one would be that we are going to uh, create a so-called entrepreneurial academy, which also will promote uh, entrepreneurship among the students, but also among the other actors uh, within the university, where there is not so much of this tradition about entrepreneurship, the researchers, sometimes the, the teachers as well. Uh, and and we're really building on all the strengths of the uh, seven partners here. Hmm. Um, just let me mention that we have now over 100 participants on YouTube. I wanted to um, thank you all to be with us. Um, we have a Slido link. Um, you go on Slido and then you put uh, UUU and then you can uh, enter your questions if you have some that we could ask our participants. And we will have a look on in these questions quite in a moment. So that would be interesting. Thank you. Um, Ludwig, um, I, uh, while I was listening, I was thinking uh, about my friend who is a researcher like you and who has always always worries about uh, intellectual property and these things and, and there are different legal laws uh, regarding higher education um, as we have seen in Hungary and there are also especially um, 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 let's say um, security mechanisms for researchers now the cooperation across uh, countries um, um, do you think um, that this let's say um, if the countries get closer in their in their regulations about um, um, intellectual property. Is this a good thing? Is this a progress? Uh, where are the difficulties here and what these university alliances, what they are doing in this field? Well, I think that here we are really exactly touching upon what is the global objective of this initiative. Uh, it started uh, by, uh, uh, let's say, uh, boosting more, let's say, the education part of it because it has been funded under the Erasmus program and basically here precisely respond uh, typically, uh, what we are going to develop all the 41 alliances is really a, a mapping of all the, the, the obstacles that we are currently facing. But there are also, there are also opportunities that we can really grasp uh, on uh, building new ways of teaching uh, among the different partners, how to create the so-called uh, European degree, etc. So this re re request requires actually to, to find, uh, identify all the uh, obstacles which are uh, sometimes due to the differences in regulations uh, within the, all the European countries. And the same goes with the, the, the research and innovation, where although uh, research and innovation is something which is already more developed at the level of the whole European Union, there are still some national limitations in uh, indeed sharing uh, uh, intellectual properties, etc. So this is typically where we want to go all together to identify uh, within uh, with all the different activities which will be because when you look at the end with the 41 alliances there will be hundreds of initiatives which will not be all the same so with this we will have a full mapping of all the opportunities and, and obstacles that we need to solve so i think this is exactly what the, the whole initiative is, is aiming, aiming at um, uh, I would like to um, also to ask Daniela in this point, um, you are also and also um, easy to you uh, develops um, online um, um, platforms uh, for teaching, for instance, um, but um, like a more political question, are these uh, virtual um, um, infrastructures that the universities alliances are building, are they, um, uh, do you consider them as a, a genuinely a European solution? Is this something where a public institution institutions build infrastructures which are independent from uh, commercial in, um, infrastructures like Zoom and Google and so on? Is this part of the plan or is this just my interpretation? Uh, Daniela, uh, how, Daniela, do, you how do you see that? Of course, we want to build the tools. In this case, what you're mentioning is a uh, technology uh, tool for education, but also for uh, societal engagement that should be as open as possible. So what you witness is that for many activities currently, the tools available are paid tools. But I strongly, and we believe in fact, that we have to build also the expertise and continue to cooperate in Europe so that the online learning, online knowledge uh, availability is uh, inclusive, open, and can really be put to the service of as many learners and, uh, uh, and citizens as possible. 
Of course, there are a number also of issues that need to be taken into account. So it's not trivial to build a, a virtual platform or a virtual campus. There are security issues, there are GPDR issues. Uh, so it's a complex, a very complex, complex topic. And like Ludovic was saying, working with the, such a big partnership also allows us to have access to a multitude of expertise of human resources, not all of only financial resources. We can discuss that later because obviously what we are start, starting to build with our 41 alliances is something extremely complex um, that will also financially require a certain degree of stability for the pilot phase and beyond. That is very key towards the success of the initiative. And when you start talking about uh, IT and online technology, that's also something that has uh, major costs that are not always uh, affordable for a single institution. So again, another opportunity for major progress within an alliance. And well, well. Their approach is uh, um, a wonderful example of how universities can be in Europe more than anywhere, anywhere else in the world in the future. The engine of a society that is based on knowledge, on innovation, and that can be more cohesive, that can allow citizens like Ludovic was saying to be able to think critically. We see also the spreading of fake news nowadays. And mm -hmm. in UFA also, we believe that it's our responsibility as universities who to contribute to citizenship, where individuals are able to distinguish truth from false information. Hmm. hmm. I like this answer. In fact, it's a good, uh, a good um, point um, to come to the end of the first half of our encounter here. Um, uh, do we already have uh, questions on Slido? Um, may I have them? Okay, I'm getting them now. Um, um, I want to say um, the break that will come in, in, in two minutes, um, we will unfortunately not have our science slam. Uh, the artist is ill, but we improvised uh, some short news break on European higher education, um, after which we pick up with our other two guests, uh, Vanessa de Biesanton from the European Commission and Case Kauenar, who is the coordinator of the um, Aurora Alliance. Well, I don't know if the, if the Slido questions are coming. Seems so. I'm really curious what, what people are asking. Thank you. Uh, it's loading. Uh huh. Right. Um, well. Are they ranked? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, ah, um, well, this is a question for Vanessa de Biesanton. Question to Monsieur Tilly. Um, I don't believe this is Artur Banaszkiewicz from Poland. Um, um, Ludovic Tilly, this question is for you. Um, I don't believe you gave an example of benefits of international dimension to the initiative. Can you be more specific, please? Hmm. The question, what, what, what um, um, I, uh, be more specific? Arthur, Arthur said, Arthur said, I don't believe you gave an example of benefits of international di of the inter international dimension of the initiative. Can you be more specific, please? Like benefits of the international dimension. Well, actually, the, the, this would require a lot of time because the the the, the, the benefits of uh, international cooperation are so 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 numerous um, for instance when i when i look at uh, my own university uh, of course what i'm going to, to briefly discuss here are uh, numbers before the covid-19 pandemic crisis of course because as we all know uh, physical mobility has been severely impacted by this uh, this crisis, of course, and it's still it's still the case. But uh, before before this, uh, we had uh, and we still have thirty thousand students, among which are about four hundred uh, sorry four thousand four thousand international students, 
and about 50% of our international doctoral candidates are also international. Uh, so, so which means that uh, typically this, uh, uh, this flow of students uh, in and out uh, has an immediate impact on how our own university is, is transforming. This is really helping what we call the internationalization at home, because all the presence of these international students within the classroom do have an impact on also the understanding of the other uh, that the other students do have. But also our own research is also uh, positively affected by the presence of all these international doctors uh, candidates, because they have sometimes a different uh, research culture that they would also uh, enrich uh, the way we, we perform research. Uh, and, and we could add a lot of other uh, very positive aspects, just like we all know uh, that students who have uh, performed uh, in Erasmus mobility are changed forever. And I'm not just talking about uh, the so-called Erasmus babies, I'm, I'm just talking about the millions of students, being uh, one of them mm -hmm. myself, mm -hmm. that once you have done uh, mobility abroad, uh, you, you, your critical uh, thinking is completely uh, different, you, your mind is completely open to the others, etc. Cetera, et cetera. All right, um, I see we have more need of discussions like this. We come back to this and now, for a little moment, we have a short news break uh, before we return with the other two. Um, Daniela and um, Ludovic, thank you very much so far for the conversation. Um, let's go to our uh, news break now. Thank you. <laughs> 